Okay, guys. So very, very brief introduction uh, for those of you who haven't watched me announce before, don't know who I am. Very cheesy picture on there. Um, I am a fully qualified chef turned digital entrepreneur. Uh, I've been in the online space now for 20 years. Uh, I've been doing CRO for 11 years. Um, I built the largest affiliate community online, um, which I sold back in 2017 to Neil Patel. Uh, I started in CRO in 2012. Um, so as I said, I've been doing this for quite a long time now. Um, and we've built frameworks as a company that are now used by millions of sites. And when I say frameworks, for the first sort of seven, eight years of our business, we were very much uh, focused on landing pages, on design, on conversion principles. Uh, and we were deep into the trenches. My agency, Conversion Wise, uh, has built more landing pages than any agency on this planet, something I'm very, very proud of. Uh, and those frameworks we now uh, share with people uh, and are used across millions of sites online. Um, lucky enough to co-found uh, alongside my amazing founder, uh, Andy, um, conversion wise back in 2013. So who is conversion wise? Um, as I said, we have bought more, built more landing pages than any agency on this planet. Uh, it's actually probably closer to 7,000 pages now. Uh, we've worked with 3,500 plus brands. The majority of those are e-com brands over the past 11, 12 years. Uh, we now have 11 to 12 years experience. And as you can see, some of the amazing names uh, that we've worked with. I'm proud of every company we we uh, we work with, but I, I must always shout out as a huge football fan that we do CRO for Lionel Messi. And that's something that, again, I'm, I'm incredibly incredible, proud of. But first, let's have a look at the hierarchy of conversions before we actually get into these conversion principles. And before I show you what actually is going to move the needle, let's first and foremost look at the hierarchy. Whenever we come on to someone's site or we talk about uh, conversion rate optimization, there's some really important principles that need to be uh, addressed first and foremost. And you can look at all your tests from this perspective. So first and foremost, we start from basically the bottom of the period, which is a bit strange, but we say, one, is it functional? So it's really important to make sure that your website actually works the way it's supposed to. So making sure it's device compatible, browser compatible, it's free of bugs, people can actually use it is, is an incredible place to start. That's where you want to be starting. Then we move on to accessibility. So can people access it regardless of their tech savviness? I think as marketers, we fall into that bracket that we know how to work every website, but your average person doesn't. So sometimes, you know, it's, it's the same when you're a product owner and all you want to talk about is features because you're so proud of all the shiny objects, you haven't actually looked into the benefits of how it actually works for the customer. So it's the same with your website. Can, can people access it quick enough? Is that funnel easy to use? Usability, is it user friendly? So check on mobile, tablet, desktop. Can people use your website? Can they navigate? Can they get to the where they want within a few clicks? You're not making, making sure that that user journey or that buying journey is, is short enough so that people can get to that kind of money page or that, that checkout page quick enough. When it comes to things like, uh, responsiveness and, uh, brow cross browser compatibility, you want to check out browser stacks. Now it's quite expensive, um, but it's a great kit that basically tells you how your website performs on different browsers on different uh, um, uh, devices, mobile versus tablet, but it also goes down to design, device specific uh, based on manufacturers. So iPhone versus Android versus iPhone 11, iPhone XR, etc. cetera. Um, so that's a really good one to check out. Usability testing 100%. Um, so you, you wanna Google something called five second test. Uh, and I think it's called Usability Hub. That's an affordable usability testing solution where you pay basically per person who's gonna test your site. Um, and there's various different tests that you can use. The five second test is really good. Um, that's great for value proposition. So what that is, is they will serve your page, your site, your landing page to 20 random strangers. They have five seconds to look at it and then you can ask them any questions that you want. So you could ask them questions like, what are we selling? You can ask them questions like, what is the benefit of the product? And you'll get responses that people will say, for example, I have no idea what you're selling, or we think you're selling X when really you might be selling Y. So that's a really good test. And then you want to also look at user testing. So we use a company called Conversion Crimes, um, which are very good at user testing, but there's various, uh, there's various companies and solutions out there. You'll probably find someone up, up work as well, but that's where actual users go onto your site and they click through, they go through the buying journey, they add the cart, they go to your checkout, they go to your cart page, uh, and they feedback with any bugs, any issues, 
uh, any problems like that. You can also just hire someone on Upwork who, who can do like a, a kind of a walkthrough of your site and give you a bit of an, a QA. Um, that's always worth it as well. You, you don't have to pay loads of money for that. But you can do this yourself, you know, getting friends and family to go through your site, different devices, different uh, browsers. Um, just spend a little bit of time to make sure that you're checking your sites for sure. Um, then we move down to uh, intuitive. So does the, the site sales process mass, match the, the sequence? So is it intuitive enough to sell? And then is it persuasive? Are the copy, the images, and the designs uh, convincing users to buy? Now, this is just a really good way of looking at your site. We're now going to go into what I call conversion principles. So these are the actual conversion elements that really move the needle when it comes to turning a click into a customer. Because ultimately what we're trying to do with conversion rate optimization is we're trying to make you more money from the exact same visitors. So we're not here talking about, you know, all the things that Alex is a genius at, scaling meta ads, driving more people to your site, getting more hits. We're talking about the amount of people that are coming to your site, making the most of them, and ultimately what you want to be tracking when it comes to CRO and your website is revenue per visitor or revenue per session. So how much money am I making per click per person on my site? And if I can make more per person per click on my site, then ultimately my revenue is going to increase. I can then spend more. I can then drive more people to the site and it's an ongoing thing. So what are the conversion principles? And don't worry about snapshotting this. Don't worry about looking at the text. I'm going to go through each and every one of these for you. I'm going to give you real life case studies of A-B tests that we've we've dro uh, driven at ConversionWise, my agency, uh, and I'm going to go through each and every one. Also, at the end of the, of the presentation, there's a slide where you can download this as well. So I'm going to give this to you free of charge as well. So number one, we start with irresistible offer. An irresistible offer is super, super important. We start with an irresistible offer. What can you do as you look at your product, as you look at your sales page, your product page, you know, wherever you're selling, what can you do to make your product or your offer more irresistible? How can you make it seem more valuable on that front end that people just think it's a no brainer offer? So I give you some examples here. You can include a bonus item for first time purchase. Now that doesn't have to necessarily be a physical item, but it could be. It could be a lower valued SKU. You could sell a necklace with a matching pair of earrings that don't cost you that much. You could be selling sunglasses with a free case because it doesn't, it costs you 50p. So is there anything that you can add to your product pages, to your product to make it more irresistible? Again, it doesn't have to be a physical item. It could be something I'm going to show you on the next page, but it could be something like a membership. It could be uh, insurance. It could be uh, a free workshop. It, you know, it doesn't always have to be a physical item. And I will show you on the case study a great example of that in the next slide. Could you offer a free gift? Could you gravitas the offer by offering a buy one, get one half price or buy one and we'll throw one in half price or buy one, get one free offer? So... First and foremost, look at your pages, look at your products. This put works particularly well if you have single SKU stores or you have uh, some SKUs that are selling very well. How can I make it more desirable to my, to my customers? So we move on to the case study. Now this is a wireframe, obviously due to client confidentiality, I can't show the exact before and after designs, but what I will do is I'll show you, uh, tell you which niche they're in and point out exactly what we changed. So this specific client was a, uh, I think it was an eight figure client. They were doing, uh, selling a lot of uh, basically barbecue, barbecue stuff. So um, stoves, ovens, barbecues, uh, you know, lighter fluid, charcoal for the barbecue. They were like a, a kind of go-to barbecue store. And what we did is we took their best selling product and we, we attached a free barbecue cooking book. So it's a digital download. We didn't have to physically send it to them. Yes, obviously the company had to pay to get that, that ebook, uh, developed once, but it was a one time payment. It was a one to many thing. You know, it might have cost them $500 to get this simple ebook, a cookery book, uh, done. And then it's just digitally delivered to them via Shopify every time someone purchased that product. But we AB tested having the product without the ebook and then having the product with the ebook. As you can see here, we just put a, a, a small snapshot underneath the uh underneath the the product image with a call out that says free ebook included we have a picture of the cover of the ebook and that added an additional sixty eight thousand dollars uplift in revenue per month 
just from adding that free book ebook to the specific product on that product page. So when we run A-B tests, um, unless we're taking bigger swings, um, and that's probably something I, I probably should have said at the start. So the, the way we, we look at uh, how we segregate our clients, because we have two solutions. We have a design solution where we design stores and pages for our customers. And then we have our ongoing CRO A-B testing. Uh, it's more than A-B testing, but but that the, the solution uh, where it's an ongoing service. We split it into volume of data. So we say, if you have under 100,000 hits per month, you're better off taking bigger swings because you don't have the volume of data to quantify a winning or losing test quick enough. You're better off just redesigning your tour store, your product pages and taking uh, a split test. So one page versus another and having it dramatically different. If you're above 100,000 sessions per month, then you can quantify tests quick enough. You can quantify them. Typically, you should run tests for two weeks anyway, but you can you can get to statistical significance a lot quicker to figure out if it's a losing or a winning test. And typically, if you're above 100,000 sessions per month, Alex, you'll know this, you already have something that works. So you don't want to disrupt that. You don't want to pattern interrupt. You don't want to completely change it by redesigning everything. And that's one mistake we see a lot of brands make is they'll come to us and be like, we have half a million sessions. We want to redesign our store. We're profitable. And we're like, no, like that's the worst thing you can do. It's the worst thing because A, you probably have a lot of repeat business. And when you have repeat business, people are used to using your store. Uh, and if you change it, those people will, will, will bounce. Uh, and B, you don't know that that's actually going to maybe tank your conversion rates. So the better way of doing it is iterating to success. It's running A-B tests, usability tests, price offering tests, uh, uh, offer tests, et cetera, to iterate to higher profits. And that's what I'm showing you here. You know, these guys were doing some serious volume, but by just adding literally this, uh, this graphic below the, the product image and giving away a free cookery book with the barbecue product, we managed to increase their revenue per month by over $68,000 just from this one test. So this is the exact same traffic going to the page, the same people, but just having that irresistible offer $68,000 in additional revenue. The free ebook offer won't work with everything. For example, jewelry, you're probably not going to use it. You know, apparel, you probably wouldn't put a free ebook with t-shirts, but something like a, a, a cookery item or, uh, you know, like, like this example of barbecue, you're, you're exactly right. It was just a, you know, something like 30 recipes to impress your, your mates at your next barbecue. Um, and you have someone on Upwork, you know, or take the pictures and you have someone on that work, write the recipes, it's a digital download and it just gets sent. Um, it, it works on high ticket items very, very well um, because typically high ticket items will be, you know, things that are more like physical big goods that you use. Um, but yeah, eBooks, not for everything. Like I say, they wouldn't work on like a, a jewelry brand or uh, on an apparel brand or maybe a supplement brand. You can test it. I, I don't think we've actually tested on supplement brands, but maybe it's like, you know, if it's, if you're selling, for example, creatine, it might be like 10 exercises to get swole in six weeks or something like that. Um, <laughs> those things could work. I would, I would try it for, for the cost of getting an ebook designed and developed on Upwork, $100, $200. Um, it's worth testing, but the idea isn't necessarily about the ebook. That was a practical example, but it's about how can we elevate our offer? How can we make this product seem so desirable that people just say yes to you? You know, it's very cliche, but Alex Hormozy, Irresistible Offers, like what can you add to your e-com product to people just to see that perceived value is just so much more. If you want something, you wouldn't just go to that site and buy it. You typically will have two or three competitors where you will look across them, look which ones gets the better reviews, you know, look which one's the best price point. But if they, they're comparable on pricing, what makes you stand out? And it's exactly that. It's if you can stand out and, and make that offer even more irresistible, um, yeah, you're, you're going to get the sale, 100%. Um, so moving on to principle number two, uh, UX, UI, and usability. So, so this is huge. And when it comes to, to usability, it's not just about where things are on the page. Um, you have to think about the whole journey. So you have to think about from click to purchase, click to confirmation, making that journey as smooth as possible, removing any barriers uh, is, is super, super important. But it's also about the page itself. So looking into things like font sizes, looking specifically into demographics. So let's say you're targeting older people. It sounds stupid, but you need to use bigger fonts. Um, 
layouts of, of, of correct, uh, correct layouts of, of hierarchy of specific pages. And this is a great example I'm going to show you on the next stage. And, and one, again, one mistake that a lot of people make on collection pages, uh, I'm about to show you as well. Um, obviously designing for mobile experiences first, but making sure that across all devices, everything is in line, everything is easy to use. There's no barriers to entry. There's no blockage in your funnel. There's no additional steps or additional actions. Um, again, it sounds silly, but even as far as things like product pages, if you have variants on SKUs, instead of using drop downs, just putting those variants uh, there on the, on the above the fold on the PDP so people can just click them is one click versus clicking a drop down, then clicking them is two clicks. And you also give people a comparable if they're, they're not in a drop down where they can see them at once rather than clicking the drop down, then seeing, then clicking them. It's all things like that, reducing the steps, reducing as many uh, actions as it takes to actually get that product added to cart and then checking out. So here's a really good example. Um, and this is one that I would implement and test straight away. And by the way, when I say test, it's really important that you just don't go and implement these because these will not win on every single store. CRO is a very much, yes, frameworks and principles that I'm sharing you are typically a one size fits all. But CRO and A-B testing is, is specific to your brand. It's specific to your audience, your attribution channels, your demographic, uh, all of the above. So you need to be cognizant of testing these, not just implementing them. So when it comes to A-B testing, I would personally use something like convert.com. That's what our agency uses. Um, we are the fastest ever uh, platinum partnered agency on convert.com. We love it. Um, so I would use uh, convert.com to A-B test this. So what, what that means, if for those of you who aren't aware of what A-B testing is, is you build a version of A, which, sorry, your, your, your version A is your control. So it's the page that you have already. You then build a different version of the site in convert, which is B, and you, you basically A-B test the two. So you drive 50% of traffic to A, 50% of traffic to B, uh, and convert will tell you which one's statistically significant, which one is going to convert better, what the revenue per session increase or decrease is versus A versus B. So this is a collection page, and this is all to do with usability. So before, and what a lot of people do, our customers were only showing one product card on collection pages. So above the fold, they were showing a one by one blocks. So you go onto collection page and you see one product. Now, a collection page is exactly that. People want to see a collection. Almost view your collection page as if you walked into a physical clothing store, for example, you want to be able to, within one view, compare all the t-shirts together. It would be pointless if one t-shirt was here and one t-shirt was five minute walk in the other direction. So people want to be able to filter and they want to be able to see collections on collection pages. Another cardinal sin when it comes to collection pages, if you look at your collection page now and you have these huge fucking banners or these huge titles with big descriptions above the fold, which pushes the products down, you are leaving money on the table. Get rid of them. I understand you might need them to search, so put the text below the products. You can have a title, but don't have these big banners, don't have these big blocks of text that push the actual products and collections below the fold. So what you want to do is go to a two by two ratio. So we did two simple things. One, we went two by two. So instead of showing one product and then you have to scroll to another product, we showed two by two product, which allowed us to actually showcase four products above the fold. And two, we added a quick add uh, action on the cart. Now, this doesn't always work. The quick add, the two by two, nine times out of 10 will convert better. The quick add is very product specific. So you need to think about what you're selling. If it's a consumable, if you get a lot of repeat business, quick add works very, very well because people just want to quickly add what they know they already want. Uh, if it's a high ticket or something else, Typically, you'll need to pre-sell them, so you'll actually need to take them to that product page where they can see more information. The collection page is pointless if you only have one SKU, so I would just have, if you do have to have a multi-page store for one product, then you just need a, a, a product page. I probably wouldn't. I, if I was selling one SKU, I would just have a direct response aggressive sales page if you were doing paid media. Um, but yeah, when, when you have an e-com store with multi-SKU, like you say, Alex, yeah, that's, that's when you would run this. You would have a collection. So this test, uh, this was actually, uh, I can reveal this. This was for G Fuel, um, one of our clients. So the energy drink, uh, giants that sell energy drinks online. Uh, and this added an extra 135k uplift in additional monthly revenue. The, uh, the, the point I want to stress is, 
This isn't this isn't uh, paid marketing. This isn't email. This is additional revenue from the same visits. So it's all incremental increases, which is the beauty of CRO. So instead of actually allowing people to go view your competitors' stores, why not put in front of their faces on your store? And what that is, is value proposition. So how can you highlight your product's unique selling points and value and benefits, benefits the key word here, over your competitors? If you do that, you're going to get more and more sales. Me and Alex just talked about it, why the logic is around that. Uh, but don't allow them to go to the other pages. Just show it on your page. So here's some examples. So highlighting the exclusive benefits, um, having them above the fold is crucial. We'll go into copy in a minute, but instead of product descriptions, having benefit-driven bullet points works very, very well. Using Im images and infographics. A lot of people, this is a huge missed opportunity. So when you have your product images above the fold, most people have a product page, they'll have a carousel of images. And by the way, the more different types of images you use, the more you're likely to convert. Actually annotating those images with the benefits is a huge winner. So if you take your product images in your carousel above the fold on the product page and you actually annotate them, so draw lines and have the USPs pointing to the specifics within your product. For example, if you're selling an electric toothbrush and the battery lasts for three weeks, have a line that points to the battery in that product image and says three week battery life. Uh, you know, have a line that draws to the, the nozzle on the brush that says, you know, deep cleanse every time. People, people are ineffectively lazy. So you have to point things out for them. And this is a really good way of doing it on your product images. And then what Alex was talking about, showcasing the, 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 the way that your product outperforms your competitor's product. So what are your unique selling points? Now, there's several ways to do this. If you are in a, in a com in competitive niche and you don't feel like you want to call out your competitors, you can actually compare a conception within the industry instead of a competitor. So what I mean by that is you could say, for example, protein is better than creatine. And this is why. So you're not you're, you're generalizing a conception. You're not you're not going after your competitors directly. And by the way, if you do, you're probably better off converting. But I understand not everyone wants to do that. But you're 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 going after a belief in the market. So you might say, uh, like I say, creatine is 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 better for uh, gaining muscle than protein, and you prove why. So comparison tables are super super useful for that. Having ticks versus crosses. Is just a very clear indication of how your value is so much better than your competitors. So this is the test that we ran, um, and this was just slightly below the fold. So if you imagine you have your product page, you're, you're on mobile, you have your uh, your call to action, your product images, you scroll down, you've got a nice little ad seen on section, and then bang, we interjected a brand, our brand versus others comparison chart. Uh, really, really easy to do. Again, make it very visual. The more text you have on this, the, the less it's going to convert. You just want very clear statements and you want very clear ticks versus crosses. Don't use like stats or figures because they're not as visually appealing as like a, a nice tick versus a cross, yours versus the other. So just interjecting that one simple section on one of our uh, client's pages, uh, an additional 32, nearly 33K uplift in revenue from this one specific test. I often see... Uh, this comparison table, oftentimes they're putting it like lower. Uh, that converts better in your experience. Uh, no, so I would, I would. Our frameworks actually teach that you should put it lower. Um, for this specific test, we did do it higher. Um, all I can, uh, all I can say is, I, I think that was probably due to the specific product that we were selling was in a very, very competitive niche. So the comparison was super, super important. So they just tested it above. Um, it goes without saying that. Elements obviously higher up the page are more likely to get viewed. So it was a very, very important principle within this specific test uh, that they tested it above the fold. So it's worth testing in both locations. But on this specific test, this worked just below the fold because we were trying to break a hugely competitive. This was actually for a female supplement. So it was a female, uh, almost like an AG1, like a, a Athletic Greens daily supplement where they were trying mm -hmm. to break into the UK market and they were going against brands like AG1. Um, so they needed to quickly showcase how they were better than those brands because they didn't have the brand 
value or following already. Social proof, everyone knows about this. Um, I banged on about this for, for years, probably on Alex's YouTube channel three, four years ago. Uh, we, we kind of talked about this stuff, but you cannot have enough social proof on your pages. Don't just think the social proof stops at uh, a kind of testimonial or review section. Social proof should be everywhere. It should be on your collection pages. It should be within your carts. It should be within your checkouts if you're using Shopify Plus. Um, social proof is is crucial. So it leverages human trust and instinct. It leverages other people's emotions for your own credibility. So it's a good way of saying, hey, we are socially trusted. We are reviewed or rated by other people. Therefore, uh, I subconsciously now trust this brand because of the social proof that they're purveying. One really cool thing that you can do, and you'll see this on this example here, this is a jewelry brand that we work with. Uh, above the fold, we added a testimonial below the main CTA. Now, we did this for two reasons. One, social proof, ticks a box, amazing. But two, testimonials are really amazing bits of real estate to handle objections. And what I mean by this, and we'll go into this later on in the presentation, but if you are not doing post-purchase surveys, you should be. But if you survey your audience or you speak to your customer support centers and you ask them what the most common objections people are coming up with before purchasing your product, try and find a testimonial that answers that objection. For example, if we're selling jewelry and people are saying that they're not sure the, the quality or the finish of the jewelry, find a testimonial that straight away says, I was amazed by the quality and the finish of the jewelry. So again, it's all subconscious thinking, but I come onto the site, I have a concern of the quality and automatically above the fold, I read a review that goes, the quality was outstanding. My friction and my doubt over that specific point is already answered within the form of social proof. So that's a really cool thing that you can use for testimonials. Um, Highlighting the amount of purchases that you've had, the amount of happy customers, uh, showing logos of, of customers that you're trusted by. But as I said, don't just stop at your product pages. You need to have this on your collection page, on your home page, even if it's just that one little line that says, you know, rated 4.6 out of five stars by thousands of happy customers. Um, this is a test we ran in checkout. So Shopify Plus, of course, but adding an actual physical testimonial that again, handled an objection just below the call to action within the checkout itself. This was a low volume store. So this is a big win for this client. This is, this is, you know, this is a huge incremental increase in revenue, uh, but added an additional $19,000. So people always talk, uh, one of the biggest problems, uh, I'm sure Alex, you, you've got some amazing, um, some amazing insights on this, but people always talk about cart abandonment, checkout abandonment. What can we do? It's, it's the biggest common question that we get asked. These are the things that you can do. And I'm not saying you have to use Shopify Plus, but you can do this within the cart. So within your cart, having trust seals, and we'll talk about that next, but having social proof or reviews within the cart uh, really, really helps uh, that kind of abandonment rate because you're just further cementing your authority, your credibility, and people are more likely to check out for sure. Trust and credibility, it goes hand in hand with social proof. They're kind of the same thing, but trust and credibility is more around what can we do on our pages to instill trust and to make us uh, as trusted as a brand as possible. So if you're selling through direct response, which I guess, you know, most of Alex's audience is, you're doing paid marketing, you're sending to brands that aren't specifically, for example, on Amazon or aren't selling through third party trusted platforms. How can you make your brand seem real? How can you make it seem trusted and credible to a cold audience? Uh, and there's various ways to do this. We like to use what we call trust seals or trust. We use these trust policy bars at the top. What that is, is underneath your na navigation, you can just have a very, very thin line that you can kind of see here. This one's not under the nav, but you can see here that is a thin line of three to four icons plus text. And what you want to do is you want to have a look at your company and think, what are the USPs that make us really trusted? For example, are we made in America? Are we vegan friendly? Are we GMO friendly? Are, do we offer money back guarantee? Do we offer 24 seven support? You know, what are these things that make us stand out and make us trusted as a real company? Not, you know, not like fly by night. You know, we need to make, make our customers 
believe that we really care about them and we do. So trust policy bars are very, very good. Displaying payment seals work. Um, I no longer would probably say you have to do these on product pages, but within your cart, displaying those payment seals so that people know that you're trusted by uh, verified and, and, and authoritative merchants. Uh, showcasing any awards or certificates that your products may have run. This is again, a cardinal sin. People win awards or they're, they're, they're certified and they put it like way below the fold. Just have it on your product page, have it as a bullet point or here, you know, like we use this seal here, made in America, made in the US. Um, people like to buy from, from countries where they're, 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 they're living. Um, so if you're targeting US, you're made in the US, put a made in the US sign on your page. I guarantee you will sell more. Um, and then, yeah, like I say, highlighting anything that makes you trusted. So this is a test that we ran in cart. Two simple changes. One, we added trust seals. So here, just above the fold, this this was a uh, a brand that sold um, handbags, basically. Uh, so they sold handbags and straps and accessories for for females on handbags. Pretty pretty big brand. We still work with. What we did is one, we added trust seals within the cart. So within your cart, we use the cart slider. Uh, as an argument, cart page versus slider, I would typically normally go for slider. They tend to perform better. But just above the uh, product here, we actually interjected the three important elements that made us trusted. So that was uh, next day uh, shipping, free returns, and satisfaction guarantee. Those three things really make you trusted as a company. So we put them in the cart. And then the second thing we did, again, when you're comp competing with brands like Amazon, et cetera, um, people, if they're buying from a brand they don't know, if you don't have expected delivery dates or you don't know when that you're going to get the product delivered, people will bounce from your cart because they, they don't, they don't trust you. They don't know who's a brand. They don't know they're going to get the product. So by just adding the expected de delivery date here in the cart as well, it's another form of trust and credibility that you're actually going to stick by your word and deliver that product on a specific date. Um, these guys saw an incremental increase of 127,000 plus in additional revenue per month. The reason this is so high, you always see bigger monetary tests within the money pages. So your cart, your checkout, for example, um, you're always going to see those big increases. So two simple changes, all focused around trust and credibility, a lot of money uh, left on the table beforehand. Persuasive copy. So this is uh, the Messi store that we uh, run CRO for. Um, and we've done several things with their store plus other, uh, other client stores now. This is one as a CRO agency that will, if for those of you, if you run a CRO agency, you'll know what I'm saying. It will piss your clients off, but it will make them a lot of money because copy changes are very easy. Anyone can make copy changes. Anyone can do a copy AB test. You know, it's this headline versus this headline. But normally, copy and images are what move the needle when it comes to uh, CRO more than most things when it comes to a sales page, for example, or a product page. So they're definitely things you should test. Using persuasive copy, emotive and compelling languages that resonates with the audience. That's really important. So uh, make sure that you survey your audience. Think of uh, buzzwords that they're using. What's a common uh, language and words that they're using and speak to them within their specific kind of types of language. Uh, is really going to resonate with them. Um, using compelling uh, benefit focused headlines. So again, old cliche features tell benefits sell, focus on benefits over features, always talk about how it's going to benefit them as opposed to what the product is and does. People care less about how they get out what they want out of your product and more about what actually they are getting out of their product. Um, so lead with them. Lead with what actually is your customer going to get out of this product? How, they, how is it going to benefit them? Uh, how, is, how, is the, how are they going to get that end value that they're purchasing? Then you can tell them how you deliver it with the features. Um, and dress your audience directly. So this is a really good one. Uh, for, for those of you who are doing e-com, this works. But also for those of you who have uh, courses or me memberships, talking uh, and using the word you and almost talking to someone as if they already are a customer works very, very well. So when you join today, once you've purchased, once you've received your product, you will get this benefit. You will be the envy of your friends, not just like be the envy of your friends. Speak about you. Get them into the mindset that they've already purchased your product. Really, really simple test. Anyone can do this. Anyone watching this workshop, go and do this on your best selling SKU. And I all but guarantee you will see an increase in revenue per visitor. Changing your boring 
descriptions of your products to benefit driven bullet points. Really easy exercise. Go to ChatGBT, give it your description, your product description right now, and just prompt it by saying, change this description into a benefit driven bullet point list of three bullet points that talks about the outcome and the benefit to the consumer of the product. And it's gonna spit out these short, punchy, benefit driven bullet points put them in bullet points in your description and highlight the benefits in bold. This test nine times out of 10 again wins, but test it. This was a client we did this for um, $47,000 uh, in revenue every single month just from this simple test. Again, this is a high volume client as well, but just from changing that boring description to benefit driven bullet points, a monumental increase uh, in monthly revenue, which is just um, amazing. You moved uh, the shop, uh, like add to cart button, like above the fold. Yeah, it, exactly right. Instead of having, you know, five, six paragraph, uh, five, six uh, lines of text that pushes all the important elements down, condense it. It comes back to also that usability uh, slide where it's all about readability, which we didn't really talk about. We talked about font sizes, <clears throat> but readability is so important. So making sure that text is scannable. Wherever you have like, boring, long blocks of text on your site. If any of you use heat map software, by the way, shout out to heatmap.com, Dylan Ander. If you're gonna use heat map software, use heatmap.com purely because uh, it tracks on revenue and not just clicks. But if any of you use scroll map or heat map software, you will see as soon as you hit these big blocks of text, you, your customers drop off. Change that text to scannable content, bold things, highlight things, make them short and snappy, use bullet points. It's exactly that, as Alex said. When you go from five, six lines of text to three hard hitting benefits, you allow yourself to pull up that call to action as well. And I guarantee that will be one of the reasons they saw that increase in revenue, 100% right, Alex. Okay, moving on to the next slide, objection handling. So this is one that a lot of people forget. Uh, every single person that comes to your site will have a doubt in their back of their mind. They'll have some form of question unanswered, they'll have some friction point, they'll have some doubt as to why they won't purchase your product. One of the greatest things you can do is go and study your support tickets or go speak to your support uh, staff if you have them and mine those responses. Have a look at what the commonalities are, what are the questions people ask, what are the friction points? Again, we talked about post-purchase surveys. You should be surveying everyone who purchases your product. Use, uh, we use no commerce, great bit of software. Uh, you should be <coughs> setting up post-purchase surveys so that everyone purchases gets a question that says, hey, thank you for your purchase. Could you just take two minutes to ask us some questions, answer some questions so we can make yours and other people's buying experiences better? Now, some of those questions are specific to your product, but two questions without fail I would ask. One, why did you purchase today? Get some great insight. I purchased because I like this, I like this, I like this. Now you'll find commonalities in between those responses. You can then lean into them on the front end. But really importantly, two, why did you almost not purchase today? Because what you'll find is people will say things like, oh, I wasn't sure if you delivered to my region. Oh, I, I didn't know how long delivery took. I didn't know if the quality of the product was what I expected. I didn't know if you did it in this particular color. Whatever it may be, when you start getting data, you will have the same responses time and time again. You can then handle that objection on the front end. So if everyone is talking about the, uh, like I said earlier with the, with the social proof, the quality of the product, have a headline that just slams home about the quality, the highest quality, handmade quality earrings, whatever it may be, but handle that objection first and foremost before they have that doubt. Another great way to do that is FAQs. So your FAQs should be down the fold, but if you have uh, if you're using, and I'll show you in the next slide, if you're using um, product sliders just below the product page, and I'll show you in a minute, have an FAQ there, but use FAQs to answer the most common questions that your support center or your email or you get asked on the phone before purchase. How long is it gonna take to take the product? Do you offer a satisfaction guarantee? When will I see X outcome? When will I see X benefit? How often do I have to take it per day? How often do I have to do this, this, this? It's very specific to your product, but answer any doubts in people's minds. If people leave your page or they contact your support with a question, you as a marketer have done your job wrong. Your, your, whole, your whole angle here when it comes to handling objections is to minimize your support tickets, minimize pre-purchase questions 
as much as you can because you're answering them already on your page. So this is a, a really simple test we used. Um, we decreased, uh, th so this is your, your, your product page, you add the cart button as you scroll down just below. Obviously a lot of us will use these kind of collapsible, expandable tabs with description, shipping and returns, etc. So these guys also had share, contact us. These are not needed above the fold. Get rid of them, put them in your footer. No one needs a contact page above the fold. No one needs social share icons above the fold. They're all, they're all distractions. You don't need them in your nav. Kill them, get them right down in your footer. But what we added was an FAQ. We expanded this by default because what we found on this particular product, it was quite a, a, a complicated product is that a lot of people had objections or questions they needed answering before purchasing. So again, this is why I said at the very beginning, I'd love for every single one of you who view this video or workshop to run all these tests and to increase your revenue on every single test. I would love it, but CRO is very brand and product specific. You know, I, I've kind of alluded to who each of these tests are as far as clients, as far as the, the brands and the type of products. This product was a very high end product that needed a lot of explanation. There was a lot of questions around it, hence why this worked. If you're selling a simple protein powder that everyone knows what a protein powder is, this may not work. So that's why you test. Um, that's why you don't implement straight away because you want to A-B test. So yeah, very simple FAQ drop down, killing the distractions, 34K in uh, monthly revenue. Um, moving on to the second but last principle. And this is one that I would do when I've not exhausted the rest, but I would get the rest in place. Then I would look into this. And this is around revenue maximization. So how can we take what we're doing already and just increase the AOV, just generate more per purchase? So this is where you can start looking into things like upsells, into bundles, cross-selling, um, loyalty programs to bring people back, uh, repeat purchases, so subscriptions. So you'll actually be amazed that the amount of clients that we see still, um, we're very fortunate that we've been going for 11 years. We see hundreds of different brands per month. And it's amazing at how many kind of consumable products, for example, still don't do or try at least subscriptions or bundles. So this may seem obvious to people, but it's definitely something you need to think about and test and look into. You know, if you're a consumable product, you should at least have a subscription option. You should be bundling. You should be trying to sell more of the same product, even if it's done on a post-purchase upsell or if it's done uh, on a bundle section on the page because consumable products, people will buy all the time. So you need to make it as convenient possible for people to get a discount for purchasing more. If you're selling apparel, you should be trying at least to cross-sell within cart to, if you're selling t-shirts, cross-sell the trainers that match. If you're selling socks, cross-sell the shoes that go with them and vice versa. Um, so there should, there should be uh, revenue maximization tests on your site that you can run. Again, this is one that isn't always a winner. So you would, you would assume that in-cart upsells always work. They don't. So it's something that you have to test on each store. And speaking of the tests, two things we did here. This is an in-cart upsell example, but that's why, hence why I said they don't always work because I don't want everyone to think, oh, if I just add an in-cart upsell, it's going to work. There's various ways you should do in-cart upsells. We like to gamify it. So what we do is we don't just add an in-cart upsell. We will gamify first and foremost free shipping. So we'll have a free shipping prompt along the top that says, you know, everyone's seen them, but it will say like, add an extra $20 to unlock free shipping, but we'll take it one step further. We will then have a free gift gamified within the cart. So you unlock your free shipping. It then says, why not add an extra $30 and you can win free gift. Now, again, that free gift could be your ebook. It could be a sunglasses case for a sunglass store. Uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, it could be uh, cuts do this very well. Everyone knows the, the apparel brand cuts. Uh, you know, they give away caps. Caps probably cost them $1. But, you know, on the store, they're $30. Perceived value is huge. So if I can just spend an extra $10 to get a free cap, bang, I'm going to spend it on an extra T-shirt. So, again, this is something you test, but always gamify it. Always have progress bars. Don't just slap any random upsell within a cart and think that people will take it. Actually, that will piss people off and people will actually walk away. It has to be a complimentary product. It has to be something that goes with the product that you're selling. Uh, and as a visual, I would always, always gamify that. Um, 
So speaking of gaming, this was actually a computer gaming store. So they sell things like uh, gaming keyboards, mouses, monitors, etc. Uh, and this was a, a very simple in-cut upsell. When they bought monitors, we would upsell them keyboards. Uh, we would then gamify them with a free ship uh, with a free gifting prompt to uh, get like a free mouse, etc. Um, so it, it, you just have to work out your margins on your products and uh, and take it from there. But these these revenue maximizing uh, opportunities don't always always don't always think you have to do these by the way on your store. So these can be really easily tested on direct response sales pages. So you don't necessarily have to change your whole store and change all your product pages to offer bundles. Just build a bundled specific sales page that's not even on your store. No one can get to it. They can just see it through paid media and just validate the idea. Uh, do a do a uh, a build a bag a build a bundle page where people can add different options within the in in the page to to unlock discounts. Just try these things; they they, they really can uh, can work. And last but not least, the most important, uh, in my opinion, when you hit that over a hundred thousand sessions per month, is ongoing optimization. So I'm going to go to a, the next slide first, and I'll come back to this. But you should look at CRO as an ongoing cycle. You should look at it as this limitless loop. You start with data. So the more data you have, the more you can then go to point two where you can research and, and, and audit that data. You can look at qualitative and you can look at quantitative. You, you look at post-purchase survey responses, you uh, do review mining, you look at analytics, you look at every single data point, you look at heat maps, and you come up with essentially ideas. No one has guaranteed winners. Any CRO agencies that says they can guarantee you winners are bullshitting you. Anyone who uses predictable tests and can guarantee you X amount of tests per month is bullshitting you because every single e-com store, every single uh, uh, demographic is, is completely unique. So what we do is we do what's best for your audience. So we will be very consultative and say, you shouldn't even be A-B testing, you should be price testing. You shouldn't be doing price testing. You should be doing usability testing. No, we can't guarantee you three, guarantee you three tests per month because what you really need to do is build a, uh, a bundle landing page. So you need to work with an agency that has that approach, but you, you should be seeing it like this. You research and audit. You then create your hypotheses. So your ideas, guesswork. Yes, it's backed on data, but it's ideas of what you think is going to work. You then test that in something like convert.com and AB test, analyze the results. Now it's really important. You don't just chuck the losers away. You have to try and understand why a test lost. And again, I run a CRO agency. I've been doing it for 11 years. We have a large amount of clients. More tests lose than win. Fact. More tests will lose than win. But it's what you learn from those losing tests to then implement into future winning tests. And those winning tests will outweigh the losing tests by 50. When you get a winning test, you've seen in this, in this, in this presentation, the incremental increases are ridiculous. You then analyze the results and then you implement those successful tests by implementing what we mean is you hard code it onto your site. So there's no more AB, it's just A, that's now your control. And then you move on again to observing that data because you can probably spend more money on paid media. You join Alex's mastermind, he shows you how to drive way more traffic and then you go like this and it's always about that. So ongoing CRO is really, really important. Always be analyzing your analytics, always be collecting feedback from post-purchase surveys and reviews and a customer support and conduct those A-B tests based on the above findings and run it in a cycle like this. And hopefully that's been useful. If you guys wanna download the slides, go to this address, conversion.co forward slash workshop or scan the QR code. And uh, yeah, Alex, I will finally have a breather.